Yeah, now for the first time in modern British history, Parliament is to write a law to overturn the verdict of judges. So more than 700 uh, post office managers who were convicted in the Horizon scandal will now have those convictions overturned. Rishi Sunak also said over 500 of those affected will receive an initial £75,000 in compensation. That follows intense pressure on the government to act. Rishi Sunak made the announcement at the start of PMQs earlier. This is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history. People who worked hard to serve their communities had their lives and their reputations destroyed through absolutely no fault of their own. The victims must get justice and compensation. So when Williams Inquiry is undertaking crucial work to, under, to expose what went wrong and we've paid almost £150 million in compensation to over 2,500 victims. Uh, but today I can announce that we will introduce new primary legislation to make sure that those convicted as a result of the Horizon scandal are swiftly exonerated and compensated. We will also introduce a new upfront payment of £75,000 for the vital GLO group of postmasters. And can I thank my honourable friend, the member for Thurston Moulton, for all his hard work on this issue. He will set out more details to the House shortly. We will make sure that the truth comes to light. We right the wrongs of the past and the victims get the justice they deserve. This announcement only automatically applies to England and Wales and this evening we're going to explore how and when it might be rolled out to apply in Northern Ireland for which these matters are devolved. But as for how it is envisaged to work, the Post Office Minister, Kevin Hollandrake, put a bit more meat on the bone, especially as to how compensation claims will be managed. But we cannot make the provision of compensation subject to a detailed examination of guilt. We could just, we just, because we have concluded that to do so would be unfair to individuals to ask the court to do that again. And we cannot turn this into an administrative exercise. So all we ask is that par, as part of their claims of compensation, postmasters sign a statement to the effect they they did not commit the crimes of which they're accused. Anyone subsequently found to have signed such a statement untruthfully will be putting themselves at risk of prosecution or fraud. I do not pretend to the House that this is a foolproof device, but it is a proportionate one which respects the ordeal with which these people have already suffered. It means that an honest postmaster will have his or her conviction overturned and just by signing one document can secure compensation. Yeah, so um, interesting point to think about how it's going to apply in Northern Ireland. The DUP MP Ian Paisley had questions around that. He stressed the scheme should include Northern Ireland as soon as possible. Uh, This was an appalling travesty and uh, impacted the lives of so many innocent people in all four corners of this kingdom and our hearts go out to those people and I really do welcome the swift action that the government is now taking to resolve this problem and uh, I hope that it goes some way to help those people through uh, what's been a terrible time. Will he assure me that with regards to Northern Ireland he will not allow any delay whatsoever in the implementation of these proposals. Um, excuses are used all the time where well, there's no devolved assembly in Northern Ireland. No devolved minister had any role in this. Therefore, there's no role for them with regards to dealing with the victims. Sort it out from as quickly as possible there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Hollenrake says the government is working towards making it a UK-wide scheme. Here's what he said. We are very keen to make this a UK-wide scheme so everyone knows exactly where they stand. As I said before, the same issues, under, uh, defact, despite the fact the uh, legal system is different in Northern Ireland, uh, the assembly of the cases was done by the post office in, all, in most cases, the vast majority of cases, so the same issues apply. So we don't want to see any delay. We will be engaging with the Northern Ireland Irish authorities very keen to do that as quickly as possible. So the Horizon Post Office scandal is a very long, ongoing thing. Uh, we haven't actually mentioned it yet, though, but it took an ITV drama to, to really galvanise public opinion. Mr Bates versus the Post Office. The government's now acted. We have the Financial Times political editor George Parker with us. Um, yeah, George, is amazing what a TV programme can do. Absolutely incredible. Um, the way that this has touched the nerve with the public is, is incredible. And uh, in a way that in years of investigative journalism has not really done because it brought home to people the human suffering involved in this scandal. And it's forced ministers to act. And you heard Kevin Holloway there in your clips. 
He said earlier on today that the government had been considering, even before the documentary was broadcast, the idea of this blanket legislation to exonerate people. Well, I'm not so sure that the post office employees would necessarily go along with that. It's been given a real sense of urgency by the by the broadcast of that documentary, or that drama, rather. I saw some analysis, George, that MPs may be caught a little bit off guard by the speed at which Rishi Sunak announced this. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think the speed, the speed has been something which has been lacking throughout this whole saga. So I think you're right that people were surprised to, that he was able to make this announcement as early as lunchtime today at Prime Minister's question time. But plainly, it was something he just wanted to nip in the bud. Um, I think he genuinely felt there was a, a real outrage here, and he repeatedly referred to this being the great, we call it the greatest miscarriage of justice in our nation's history. So I think he wanted to act very quickly. The options were fairly uh, clear. Obviously, it sets a precedent and as an you know, example of a rare example of Parliament trampling all over judicial independence. But I think the view was taken in the heart of government that in this circumstance it was justified. Thank you very much. George Parker there, Financial Times political editor. Solicitor Michael Madden represents 17 sub-postmasters in Northern Ireland, three of which came forward off the back of that ITV drama. Um, these exonerations, Michael, welcome back to the programme, they're going to apply in England and Wales, but not automatically in Northern Ireland. What is your assessment of where that leaves your clients? The concern that the, the new scheme won't automatically apply to Northern Ireland is definitely a concern. Uh, I suppose the big question I would have is, will the new scheme depend on Stormont being up and running? Uh, and if it does, then uh, there's very clear questions then for the politicians. When, when will that happen? Um, Ian Paisley saying in the comments today that it wasn't a devolved minister who created this um well, scandal, if, if you like, he was involved in the Horizon scheme or the post office, so it shouldn't be down to a devolved minister to deal with picking up the pieces. Are you convinced by that argument? Uh, I'm not so sure. that Downing Street today released a bit more information that the devil is going to be in the detail once we get the full details, but one of the things that Downing Street said today was they hoped convictions would be overturned by the end of the year. Now, again, if that is dependent on Stormont, again, that would be a question uh, for politicians. Now, it's between Stormont and uh, Westminster as to where uh, the legislation will lie, but uh, if it is dependent on, on Stormont, I would have concerns at that aim to have convictions overturned by the end of the year won't be met. In theory, though, it is possible, is it, for legislation to be passed under the current circumstances in Westminster in order to trigger the effects in Northern Ireland. We've seen it around other issues. Chris Eaton Harris has made decisions. Uh, it is. It is possible. Uh, the uh, Westminster could pass uh, legislation that would uh, would affect uh, Northern Ireland. You, you've seen uh, um, legislation passed, for example, which has ended uh, the uh, legacy inquests. Uh, obviously, a very controversial move, and w- which we're involved ourselves. But um, so that that kind of legislation can be brought in to to apply in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I'm also thinking of the legislation around abortion, of which came in around Irish language and culture, that kind of kind of stuff. Uh, it all came from Westminster. Um, where Where is your gaze, though? Is it on behalf of your clients to Westminster, or are you looking up at the empty seats in Stormont? Well, as a lawyer, uh, it'll depend on the law that's introduced. So uh, whenever uh, the, the proposals are made and they, they become concrete in legislation, as a lawyer, um, I'll have to look at uh, what that legislation is and, and, and the venue of it. Um, uh, it's a bit outside a lawyer's control as to what, what legislation is, is brought in, but certainly uh, once it is, we'll, we'll be analysing it for, um, very closely. Michael, just a, a point from what Downing Street is saying, that it's working, it, it will work with, and I think these conversations have already begun, uh, to be fair on them, um, they're going to work with Scotland and Northern Ireland to ensure the victims wrongly accused in those nations can also be cleared. So, I mean, taking them there at their words would imply that they're going to get it done whatever way that necessarily may be. Th- that would be great if, if there's a will there. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, public interest now and public pressure to get these convictions overturned. So um, if the will's there, hopefully hopefully it'll it'll come to fruition and, and uh, it'll happen. Uh, to, to be fair to the judiciary here in Northern Ireland, any cases that have gone before the, the courts, uh, the Lady Chief Justice has, has expedited the cases and given them priority. Um, certainly uh, it's within the post office's control 
to concede any applications that are still within the court. Uh, there's a case that I'm involved with at the moment where there was a, a vast amount of material dropped on the PPS back in uh, November. And PPS have said it's going to take them at least six months just to just to read through the material. So uh, certainly in that case, for example, uh, uh, post office could take the view uh, to to concede the appeal, in which case you don't even need any further legislation. Mm. Um, they, they have done it in other cases, the Alan McLaughlin case that, that I was involved with, they, they conceded that appeal. So yeah, we're going to speak they're, to they're, Alan they're, McLaughlin. They're, mm-hmm. So, so there's th- different ways to skin a cat, is the, is the phrase. Michael, thanks very much. Um, no doubt we will speak again as this situation becomes a little clearer. But fundamentally what we've seen today is an elected parliament overruling the verdicts that have been standing of judges. However compromised those verdicts may or may not have been, it was politicians stepping in to overrule the court. What considerations does that throw up? Let me introduce you to James Chalmers, Regis Professor of Law at the University of Glasgow. Um, In principle, are you concerned by any unintended risks when you see a government doing this, stepping in and overriding and overruling a court judgment? I'm not, no, because what the government is doing here is not taking a new decision about the facts of an individual case, which I think I think would be very concerning. It's saying there's a whole swathe of cases here that are just compromised and tainted and where the verdicts can't be relied upon because of a systemic failure. I, I think that's, that's not government stepping into the shoes of the courts. It's government doing something quite different from the role of the courts in deciding individual cases. Interesting to hear Kevin Hollenrake, the minister responsible for the post office, he was quite quick to say, look, this, this is not a criticism of the judiciary, saying that the judiciary acted in good faith with the information it had at the time, effectively pointing the finger at the post office rather than the judiciary here. Exactly. If you look at some of the decisions the courts have reached so far, the amount of unravelling you have to go into to work out exactly what role Horizon played in a particular case, what went wrong, what evidence wasn't tainted, what evidence was, what, what mattered, that's not something the courts can do quickly. And they need, of course, the lawyers to have time to prepare those cases. So the only way to achieve anything just as quickly is to take the sort of blanket approach that's being proposed today. Does this happen very often? No, there really isn't a precedent for, for doing this. But the closest I, I can think of is that the government did something similar in England and Wales and, and in Scotland later on with historic convictions for, for gay sex offences, saying that these, are, these laws are legitimate, these laws shouldn't have existed. So we're going to create a system there. And that was done on a more individual basis. But it allowed the Home Secretary to basically remove convictions from the records uh, without going to the courts. And that, that was similar in the sense that what the government was saying is that this is a systemic problem. It's not about the facts of an individual case. Either it's for different sorts of reasons, a whole batch of convictions that we just shouldn't rely on anymore. Uh, one final one, uh, and it's, I suppose it's the, the nuts and bolts of how this will work. So the way it was described is you're going to sign a form saying, look, I didn't do the things I'm accused of, uh, and therefore you get your, your conviction quashed. Now the government did say, look, we can't say that every single person who was named because it's not a courtroom, the, the House of Commons is, de- is absolutely definitely innocent, but I suppose it taps into that idea of the law protecting the innocent primarily rather than chasing the guilty. Yeah, it, it does leave this kind of long-stop option there that if somebody was, was shown to be flagrantly abusing this, if they, if they had a conviction that had nothing to do with their eyes and, and they're lying to get, to get that compensation, then in theory there could be a prosecution further than knowing for fraud. I'd be very surprised if that, if that happened, mm. but it's giving some of the issues that these are, as they are, genuine exonerations. Well, look, thanks for that. James Chalmers, our Regis Professor of Law.